This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody, and welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. I love what I do because I get to talk to people like Kyle Thomas from X Order. Now, the catalyst for our introduction is due to the launch of a new album from the group. It is titled Defectum Omnium, and it will see Light of Day via Nuclear Blast on March 8th, 2023. Now, I've got a tune to share with you before we hit the chat, but only if you're listening via the podcast apps. This one is called Forever and Beyond Despair. Once it's done, you'll hear from Kyle. For you people on YouTube, you know the drill. Can't play music. So we're going to cut to the chat straight away. Either way, let's go. Hey, Andy. G'day, mate. How are you going? Um, well, how's it going? Great, an A plus plus for punctuality. My gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I try to be. It's. Uh, I'm not going to say it's rare, but it can be rare. There you go. <laughs> Amen. Amen. No, I don't like to keep people waiting. I don't like to have to wait. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, I see. There's an American football player there behind you. There, which team do you support? Oh, that's Drew Brees from the New Orleans Saints. I'm born and raised in New Orleans, so it's always Saints for me. Okay, gotcha. What did you think of the uh, the Super Bowl, the performance side of it? Not uh, the side show, but you know the game. I, I missed it to be honest with you. I was uh, uh, playing the last show of a tour in Latin America uh, that we did with Violence, and we were in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, it wasn't even an option to watch, and I was fine with that because I can't stand the San Francisco 49ers, and I'm kind of tired of seeing the Chiefs. <laughs> Yeah, I'm hearing you. Yeah, I, th- I think I was. I, I try to get into the game. Uh, we have rugby league and rugby union here. I'm sure you're aware, but uh, sure, yeah, yeah. American football is very interesting, nonetheless. Anything to do with football like that is uh, worth investing some yeah. time into. Absolutely. You know. All right, mate. We'll kick things off. So uh, you've got a new album out, okay? So Defectum Omnium, okay. It's a brutal bastard of the beast of an album, which I anticipated, but still it's one thing to anticipate, but it's another thing to deliver. So there you go. Very intense. So that's my question essentially is when you set out to craft an album, do you set to make one as heavy as you can possibly make? Um, You got to be careful with trying to make something heavy. Sometimes when you try to make something a certain way, uh, it doesn't translate as well as just a natural feel. Um, in, in my experience with songwriting, which to me is like the, the most, the part of this art craft that I enjoy the most is the songwriting and the production side of it. And the rest is residual. But, but to me, coming up with something from nothing, starting with silence and then coming up with pieces of music and stringing them together with drums, vocals, all that stuff. There's there's nothing more disappointing than when you worked really hard on a song and you listen to it and the song's kind of lame. So, mm-hmm. so you have to really be honest with yourself, brutally honest with yourself and be willing to say, is this good? Would I spend money on this? And if the answer is no, then you might as well start over. Yeah. Yeah. You, you You've obviously got a lot of experience though as a musician and also as a songwriter as well. So the songs that were on Defectum Omnium, are they all brand new or does some of them hark back to the olden days, so the days when you were first starting out? I think some, of, maybe a couple, two or three of the songs might have been something that Jason had in some form or another in his arsenal uh, and back catalogue that he took off and that we tweaked a little bit to make it more fitting for what we're doing. The, all the songs that I brought to the table were all pretty new. I, um, everything that I wrote musically on this album was written in 2020 or, or, or since. So mm-hmm. I think maybe just a couple of pieces of music that Jason had sitting around that, that were just kind of on the shelf waiting to be used. Some of that might have been around for a little while. Yeah, gotcha. What about uh, the tale of Unsound Minds? That would be my my pick 
of the tracks so far. I've only had it for a little bit, so keep that in mind when I mention that. But a killer track, is there a story behind the lyrics there? There is, but but let me mention first, uh, I love that you said that because a guy I did an interview with yesterday said he loved every song but that one. <laughs> no accounting for taste is there, my God. So yeah, you know, but that's the beauty of this album is we 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 set out to make an album that we loved that we felt had peaks and valleys and every mm. everything from the very roots of this band to where we progressed to now. And I think we've succeeded with that. So the fact that you feel that way about that song and then somebody else feels that way about the song just goes to show you that we have a a lot of we have a wide spectrum of audience and what people expect from this band. So, um, yeah, that's that. I don't want to get too off the subject and, and forget what you uh, asked with the question, but You're right. <laughs> the, the story, the story behind that song is very inspired by what happened to a lot of people during the pandemic. Now for me, mm-hmm. the, the isolation of the pandemic, I, when I'm not on tour, I stay at home by myself and work anyway. It, like to me, the pandemic was a was a piece of cake because I I like being alone and I like working alone and I don't like leaving the house unless I have to sometimes. So, but but I know it's a big problem for a lot of people and it, you know some people didn't survive that isolation, mm-hmm. uh, which is really just tragic. So so I just tried to when I wrote those lyrics, I I really wanted to kind of step outside of what was happening to me and and try to imagine what someone else is dealing with in this instance. And the isolation can drive someone to the brink of madness and make them crave interaction with other people. But then when you actually get out there and start interacting with other people, you might, might be one of those, be careful what you wish for moments where like, now I'm not so sure I want to be around anybody because I've I've been so isolated. You know? mm. Yeah, that's a little bit of a an irony to it, you know. Yeah, yeah, I can appreciate that. Just on that point, though, you know, it was the Wall Street Journal reported, and this is a quote, by the way, was it based on a quote from Anthony Fauci that all of this follow the science bullshit that we've all been under the hammer of now for God knows how long, but particularly the six foot distancing rule that came into place that was adopted right right the way across the Western Hemisphere from Australia to Canada to New Zealand to Great Britain to, to the United States, okay? No scientific basis whatsoever, zero. It was an opinion. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when something's airborne, it's going to take, it, it's going to go more than six feet. <laughs> yeah well, I, I, I i i truly believe i i'm you know some people didn't even believe that the pandemic was real my wife is a scientist she does testing in hospital labs i can assure you that from what she has told me everything was real but what did happen that mm-hmm. i believe is that the powers that be exploited that to their advantage and uh and put us in a position where uh we're even more limited and more dependent which that's what the powers that be do am i am i right i I think so yeah Yeah, it's the authoritarian left mate they they went their hardest and they did their absolute worst and there was an epidemic of uh suicides and the isolation caused people to i drank more a lot of people drank more. I now go, and if anything, it accelerated the demise of me drinking alcohol. I no longer drink, and that's in part because I accelerated my drinking through. Not, I'm not make, trying to make this about me. Sorry, I'm just saying that the whole point. No, no, no. Amongst, that's important. Yeah, the whole point, and then amongst all of that, it was a completely abnormal and the most important thing: a moral, a moral thing to voiced on a society for the most part by unelected officials like Fauci and these other psychopaths and the World Economic Forum and the WHO. One thing I've learned in my lifetime, and it it may be to a fault that I have a lot of these feelings, I don't trust. There's almost nobody I trust. (laughs) So, So, you know, just because they say this is a good idea, do it, doesn't mean it's a good idea and that it should be done. 
Very, very true. Uh, talking about good ideas, though, Pat O'Brien, okay, he's in the band. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, first of all, thank you. From a fan's perspective, thank you for giving him an outlet because a lot of us are wondering where he'd resurface, and I'm just grateful, as I think a lot of people are, that it's with you guys. So I'm sure you've explained this elsewhere, but can you give us a story about how you connected with Pat? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, bear in mind that we are as blessed to have him in our camp as he feels blessed that we uh, took a chance on him when, according according to him, nobody else did. So, uh, you know, not that we're looking for glory in that, but um, we're happy to have helped him during a time when he needed it. And God knows we did too. So it's been a symbiotic relationship that's worked out very nicely. Um, Jason and Sasha go, I mean, sorry, Jason and Pat go back a very long way. They're both from the Cincinnati area Mm -hmm. and um, they've known each other since they were teenagers. So when we decided to move on with me being the guitar player and it was just the three of us. And we obviously needed another guitar player. Uh, I've got my skill set, but, you know, soloing and all that is something that I do a little bit. And it's not my forte. So, we, you know, you want to have a guy who can get in there and, and really burn it up on the solos, right? Mm. So he, uh, Jason asked us, what, what do you guys think about me reaching out to Pat and seeing if he wants to come jam? Sasha and I were both absolutely all for it. We, we both knew Pat casually and I enjoyed every moment I've ever spent with Pat. So I said, yeah, yeah. So he called Pat and I said, Hey man, you want to come jam with us? And, and the first, he said, the first thing Pat said to him was what the hell do y'all want to mess with me for? Mm-hmm. And he's like, what are you talking about? And he's like, look at me. Like nobody wants to touch me with a 10 foot pole right now. And he said, um, you're Pat O'Brien, dude. I don't know if you got the memo, but you know, um, <laughs> so true. people want people want to see you play, dude. And he's like, I don't know, I don't know. So he said, How about this? He said, I'm not asking you to come audition. He said, I'm asking you if you just want to come jam with your friends. And then I think he, Pat responded well to that and said, Yeah, that that sounds fun. So Pat came one day and we jammed and. We fed the stray cat, and the stray cat hasn't left yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I hope this question isn't isn't um, too insensitive. But um, look, we want to see you in Australia, obviously. Okay, um, are there any issues with Pat traveling abroad that you're aware of? Yes, uh, we're we're still trying to sort out the logistics of that. Um, Unfortunately, he was slapped with a felony with all that he went through. And so it has complicated the clarity of what can, where he can and can't go. And we've been searching hard to try and find answers. And it's not an easy thing to find answers on. Most of the time, people don't even know how to answer that question. So it's almost like we're just going to have to one day rip off the Band-Aid and give it a try and see if he gets rejected. And if he gets rejected, well, then I'm stuck playing guitar by myself. But <laughs> in the meantime, we've been blessed to have Valdemar Sricta and Apollo Cedius, uh help step in and help us out traveling. Uh, but we, we're really ready to get Pat on the stage with us everywhere. I think everywhere in the world is ready for Pat. I, I'm really starting to think what we need to do is start a hashtag free Pat campaign or something, man, because uh, this, there there are, I don't want to say anybody's name and pick on anybody, but there are recording artists out there that did way worse things than him that are out there touring right now. And I don't see how they can do it and why Pat shouldn't be able to. Yeah, look at the hip hop artists like Chris Brown who beat up Rihanna, yet can still tour, and all this bullshit. Yet, Pat, yeah, Adam, you know, you get enough, you got enough, you got enough money, and you got the right uh, representation, and they can make things go away. Yeah, very true. It's mate. that simple. I know, very true. Yeah, it all comes out of bloody money, doesn't it? Yeah, sure hey, just does. green privilege, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Hey, you, you are part of, whether people realise it or not, you are part of this grand lineage of fantastic hard music, heavy music coming out of New Orleans and Louisiana. So 
between you and Phil Anselmo, the house called Crew, and I Hate God, and there's probably a couple of other bands in there too. Okay, do, do you sure, guys plenty. you guys all catch up in your own way? Are you all sort of mates? Yeah, um, and I'm. It's a small town. It's not a very big metropolitan area here, so everybody knows each other, or somebody's related to somebody uh, in some kind of way. Um, you know. It, I, there's a lot of times I spend more time with those guys out of town than I do at home. I see them more when we're playing festivals somewhere and I hang out with them there. And it's like, I, like I was on the road with Alabama Thunder Pussy in October in Europe and I'm in Switzerland and I hate God shows up. And I'm like, you know, I went to high school with Gary, Jimmy and I have been friends and in bands together since we were teenagers. And they walk up and I'm like, how the fuck is it I see y'all at Alcatraz Fest in Belgium last year and here, and I don't, Jimmy lives like two miles from my house and we don't see each other, but I see them when I go out on tour. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> I suppose it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, you, to, to your point there, you're a bit of a, you prefer staying at home and the time that you do get out is with the music. So, and you guys yeah. are road, road, road warriors these days. Yeah, so it, it does make some sense. But uh, when we were younger, we spent a lot more time together, I think, uh, just running around, having a good time, being carefree. Uh, but, you know, most of us are either parents or grandparents at this point. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling you. Yeah, but you're on the parental front. <laughs> Hey, uh, you're, you're long on record about your feelings to about all these questions you get about and comparisons to Pantera. So I'm not going to ask you about that, but it's actually around the commentary. So do the type of comments and questions, are they are they in the review mirror now or do you still get a few? No, a lot of people still, you know, I, I every once in a while I meet somebody who feels the need to pull me aside and tell me how important it is that they tell me that they think that we were – before Pantera, like whatever, you know, it's like, and, and I, I always try to take it and deal with it in the most polite way possible. Cause you know, people aren't saying that necessarily to, to incite me in some kind of way that usually they, they think they're telling me something that I'd like to hear. And, mm. you know, I, I think there's room in this world for both bands. I think it's a good thing. Pantera's back in business. Like, I think it's good for, hard rock and heavy metal uh and the more the merrier um they've they they worked extremely hard a lot harder than we did for their success and um you know who cares whether the chicken or the egg uh came first to me they're both delicious <laughs> very good point yeah i've read you i've read your views on it i think you've always been very uh you've been very polite about it but circumspect too is the other perspective that you think you have there you go. Yeah, uh, I, I've been friends with Phil for a long time. I always got along nicely with Daryl and Rex. Um, that platinum record on the wall right there was a gift from Phil for Far Beyond Driven to, uh, presented to me and uh, and my band Penalty at the time, which became Floodgate. Uh, oh, and wow. it was just his way. Yeah, it was just his way of basically saying, hey, thanks, man, you know, for and I know what he meant. You know, he, we, we were a big influence on him personally and uh and he returned the favor by spreading our demos around to people and turning people onto us he was at one time probably the biggest cheerleader this band ever had mm. i totally miss that I mean, we, when i was just doing a bit of research i i i got to tell you i loved floodgate okay I loved the band and the and then the the album penalty it was a roadrunner release i remember because i got that and karma to burn at the same time Ah, oh, come to burn. Yeah, what a great band that, that was. First one. Uh, yeah. There you go. Um, I, that was an unbelievable yeah. album you wrote, by the way. Well, thank you. Uh, that was the album that I wanted, uh, that I was hoping to write uh, towards the end of the Exhorter era where we broke up in 93, I think it was. Mm. Um, I had... I had been itching for a long time to start doing something a little more along the lines of the early rock that I grew up on. And my brother felt the same way. So we decided let's, let's just write this together. And, uh, and then the rest of it fell into place with, with uh, Steve and Neil. And 
uh, floodgate. Uh, Roadrunner was on to it immediately. Monty Connor fell in love with it quickly. And that was an almost fan. That was something that we, I, I've never really gotten over what should have happened for that van band versus what ended up happening to that band. I, okay. Yeah. It felt like this is back well before the internet became the behemoth. We all know it to be now. So the album was released. I remember I had a sampler. I listened to that song. I, I can't remember what song it was now, but I went out and bought, I remember buying both of them on the same day and I listened to that one a lot. And then I remember interviews with you back then that would appear in a couple of Australian publications and you'd talk about drinking some red wine and writing some songs. Do you remember making those quotes? Do you remember you? Were- um, no, there was a lot of red wine and probably <laughs> a lot of pills and um, other things going around back then. So I don't, I heard the 90s were fun and that I had a great time, but I don't remember. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm I'm really grateful to give you that feedback that that's an outstanding album. Yeah. And, and I really wish that, it, that it went and lived another life. But can you give me some more insight as to why the, what happened with the demise of the band? I, I think what happened was uh, um, new metal started taking off and Roadrunner had a handful of new metal bands that they were starting to feed. And I think they just looked at the budgets that they had originally set aside for us, they decided to start putting into those bands instead. So, uh, you know how it is. The record industry is fickle and uh, nothing is guaranteed um, unless unless it's something that they expect from you. <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah. Oh, it's, been, it's, it's great to, uh, yeah, just I don't know why that bloody slipped my uh my investigation on things. There you go. That was a that's a throwback to my youth right there. Yeah, very unexpected. But thank you for writing that album anyway. But but right. Oh, right. yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Well well Roadrunner, yeah. I mean bloody Roadrunner. But nuclear blast. It's a lot better, isn't it? You it's a lot more of a liberal environment for you to create, isn't it? They have barely surfaced during the production of this album. They uh they allowed us to to produce this album ourselves they were a little concerned at first that we wanted to do it and then when we convinced them no this is the route that we need to take they said fine no problem and basically just backed off until we had a finished product and said how's it going over there and we sent them what we had been working on and they were like oh wow so they uh they were extremely excited about this album all along the way and and the fact that they trusted us with creative control without micromanaging it because it wasn't that way at roadrunner roadrunner was very involved they 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 stood over everything they had a lot more in put into what happens with the songs uh the 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 sequencing of the songs um and this time around they just kind of trusted us and i think that it worked out nicely yeah, no, oh, great. Yeah. How much time have I got, mate? Have I got time for one or two more? Is that cool? Or have you got a jet off? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. You're fine with that. Yeah. Uh, what was the catalyst behind reforming back in 2008? Because the band had been in hiatus at that point for almost 15 years. The, the promise of the potential of what could be with this band, I think, is always what drew us back into giving it another try. You know, and and when the dust settles after years and years of having disagreements, you always kind of come back to it, hoping that maybe this time we can get along. Um, That's been absolutely the Achilles heel of this band is the fact that it's just been difficult from a relationship standpoint. And uh, that to me is the biggest um, injustice in this band because I, I think had we been able to get along a lot better, we could have endured some of the other problems that we had that were hardships, but it is what it is. And, you know, I, I can't sit there and, uh, and, and pine over what could have been uh, because we're in a situation now where things are going forward nicely uh, and where people get along and we have peace. So uh, you know, if if we hadn't endured all the hardship along the way to get to this point, I don't know that we'd have the product that we have right now. And I'm grateful that we have the product that we have. 
Mm, yeah, great. Yeah. You obviously you're you're a talent of talent of filler, so music isn't the only thing that you, you invest your time into. Okay. But what inspires you with the music? Because as I say, you can do plenty of other things. But is there anything in particular, or are there many things in particular that inspire you with creating the music? Um unhappiness is probably the most important ingredient to writing uh anything. <laughs> Uh, I mean, look at Edgar Allan Poe. He was a miserable soul, and look at the work that he did. Could you imagine if if Poe was a spoiled brat? It wouldn't have happened the same way, would it? Uh, and life, life, uh, and the hardships that come with life have always been the biggest catalysts for my creativity. Hardship, struggle, unhappiness, lament, all of these things. Uh, observing the world and uh, the 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 awful conditions uh, that the world finds itself in, thanks to us, these are all easy, low hanging fruit for me when it comes to finding subject matter. But when when I'm fat and happy, I don't feel like doing anything. <laughs> I'll make this my final question for you. Then you you've led a rich and very and varied life. The music has always been on point. Uh, I'm really great to have a chat to you about um, Floodgate as well, but I mean the biography. You've got a heck of a story to share. When's it coming out? What is when? When is what coming out? Your biography. Oh Lord, I don't know that there's <laughs> enough excitement in my life to to or or or, or this much. If, there's probably a chance that if anyone read my biography, they'd be like, "It's fake. There's no way nobody nobody lived this life." <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've got some chapters that I've written for a book, maybe one day it's mostly for laughs, like fun thing, fun, funny experiences throughout my life, uh, from childhood on, uh, that I think people would enjoy reading. Um, I don't know that some of the things that I've been through are, are too personal, that I think they would bring pain to people that I love and I don't want to do that. So, um, uh, I, I keep a lot of the, the, the hardships I've been through kind of close to the vest just to protect, uh, my children, for instance, you know, I think there's a yep. lot that they don't, they don't need to know. And, uh, and if, if it, if it is a price that I have to pay for telling my side of a story, then, you know, I, I'll do anything to protect my children. I'm with you on that and very well stated, very eloquently put. There you go. Yeah. Look, if if that ever changes, I'm writing a, a biography for a Norwegian black metal musician at the moment. Just let, you know, keep it in mind. I do do these things. If you want to reach out through John or what have you, mate, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to a number right on. at the moment. There's just the issue we've got, uh, Kyle, is that a lot of these stories are going to go to the grave, unfortunately. And um, people uh, don't really want to share their story because they either don't think they're interesting or, to your point, they're a bit too personal. But in hard rock, heavy metal, extreme metal, there's just there's just stories for for decades out there at the moment. And you've got a bloody interesting one, I must say. So uh, if, you, if ever you change your mind, well, thank I'd, you. I'd, uh, I'd encourage you to think about it. That's all. It's good to know. There you go. <laughs> all right, mate. Well, hopefully, all things considered, mate, with Pat, we see you down here with Pat. Uh, in Australia soon. That would be great, man. We, we, we're dying to uh, rip off the Band-Aid and get him out on international stages. He's ready to, I think. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on uh, on the album, but, you know, most importantly, your career and the perseverance and the staying power that you've had to. Uh, God bless and thanks very much for the chat. Really appreciate it. Yeah, likewise, man. We'll do it again. Absolutely, brother. No worries. All Sounds right. great. Take Have care. a great one. Catch ya. You too. Done and dusted. What a fantastic fella. Kyle Thomas from Ex Order. As I said up top, people like Kyle are the reason I love the podcast because I get to talk to these great musicians that have a long and storied history playing hard rock, heavy and extreme metal. Wow. All right. So that's all from me. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until the next one, it's a goodbye for now.